Well, with great power comes great responsibility. Yes, that is the iconic line uttered by Spider-Man. But on Tuesday, it was also the title of a congressional hearing on the future of artificial intelligence. This hearing comes at a time when a Pew survey finds that a quarter of U.S. adults are very worried that robots and computers could replace them in their jobs. Nearly another 50 percent are somewhat worried about the same thing. My next guest testified at this congressional hearing. He is the CTO and co-founder of OpenAI, a nonprofit artificial intelligence research company that includes Elon Musk as one of its co-founders. Its mission? To ensure that AI can coexist with humanity. And most recently, it has been creating AI bots that can compete against humans in eSports gaming. Greg Brockman, welcome to the show. We're going to get to video games in a moment. But first, I want to talk about what you are telling Congress. Are we headed for that apocalyptic future that Elon Musk, your co-founder, has warned about with the coming of AI? Or are those concerns overblown, like Mark Zuckerberg says? Uh, well, th thank you for having me. So the, the statements that, that we made to Congress and the thing that we want to communicate is that the field is moving very fast, a lot faster than people realize, that we're starting to be able to build faster and faster computers uh, at a rate that is, that is uh, a lot faster than, than anything we've seen. And so we don't know five years from now what we will be capable of building. And so the, the, the question of exactly where it goes, how powerful these systems become, I think right now we're in a fog, and we're going to be in that fog until we see through the power of the, the computers we're currently building. Now, you are working hard on this on the nonprofit side. What should the government's role in AI be? So the very first place to start is to understand what's happening. Uh, so we actually recently did a study uh, to look at the growth of computation in the field and found that uh, the amount of, of compute thrown at the largest uh, AI systems has been growing at a rate of doubling every three and a half months for the past six years. That's a total growth of 300,000 times. And we project the same thing for the next five years, which means that, to put that in perspective, it would be like if your phone battery went from having one day of battery life to having 800 years of battery life, and then five years from now had 100 million years worth of battery life. And so the government, I think, is well positioned to really understand rapid change this to, to be able to set the goalpost of understand what's coming, what's happening, what we're able to do and, and what we're not. And I think if you don't know what's happening, it's going to be hard to enact good regulation and ensure that there's a good outcome. Now, you are trying to demonstrate what AI can accomplish and you are about to go on a big trip to Canada to, to participate in a big uh, video game competition along with some AI bots that have been you know, funded by Elon Musk and tend to prove essentially that a bot can be the best video gamer. Talk to us about what you've accomplished here. Well, so the thing that, that we've been working on is, uh, is playing the complex strategy game Dota 2. And this is a milestone, uh, solving complex strategy games is a milestone that we, uh, Google's company DeepMind and Facebook, have all been working towards. Because unlike board games like chess or Go, these strategy games start to capture these complex aspects of the real world. You need to be able to strategize over this very continuous time. And that what we've been able to do is show that today's algorithms, if you scale them up with massive amounts of computation, are ca capable of going far further than even the experts in the field thought. So, you know, talk to us a little bit about what you think AI will be able to accomplish in five years and then in 50 years. Well, so the things that we look at is we look at what's being done today. And so today we're able to build systems that are able to plan and reason over these long time horizons that are able to operate in these very complex environments, something very different from what we've seen before. And so you start to think about potential applications for that, where that goes, uh, that applications like elderly care robots is a perfect example, uh, where you should be able to start building systems that can be deployed in the real world, helping real people that are able to navigate and operate in these very critical, uh, very, very high responsibility areas areas uh, that we think that, that one important milestone in the next uh, five years is definitely going to be new scientific discovery, whether it's drug discovery or uh, solving, proving mathematical theorems that are outside of human reach. Now, if you fast forward to, uh, as you said, 50 years, the question of what can we build then, uh, that it's, it, it, right now it's very hard for us to put a limit on that. Uh, it's really hard for us to understand what that looks like. In the same way that if in the 1950s we were to think about what's the internet going to be, how's that going to affect us, I think our answers would have been pretty poor. And so the perspective that OpenAI has is that if you look at where this technology has the potential to go, that you could truly build an artificial general intelligence, a system that's at human level across a wide range of tasks. And how will we relate to that? How do we ensure that that world is one that's good for humans? That is the fundamental premise of OpenAI. 
Now, we've heard vastly different estimations of how many jobs will be impacted or eliminated. You know, some folks saying it's just 10 percent of jobs. Some folks saying it's going to be low income jobs. How do we know that AI isn't going to increase income inequality and make society worse? Yep. So I think that, that with AI, that there's so much potential benefit, but there's also some real risks and downsides. And I think that for technologies in general, the question of how do they affect things in the short term, I think that people always sort of overestimate how much impact they're going to have immediately, but underestimate the long-term impact. And I think the same will be true here. And so, you know, one fear that OpenAI has, one, one of our, you know, our real core mission is ensuring that the benefits of this technology don't get locked up with one entity, with one organization, with one set of people, that they should be distributed to the world. And I think that that is something that's really important. And I think that that's something that I hope lots of other developers of this potential kind of technology also take to heart. How involved has Elon Musk been? How helpful has he been? And what, what does he want here? Uh, so, yeah, so, so Elon uh, was, uh, was a critical person to helping get this organization started and uh, uh, still involved as a donor and uh, uh, as someone who, you know, I think that, that his, uh, you, you know, that, that he, he's been talking about AI, the importance of it, and how important it is to get it right for a very long time. And so I think that his interests are very, very aligned with the work that we're doing.